Well, good evening, everyone. One side, okay. Doesn't matter, he doesn't have slides, so it's okay. No slides. Um, I know we have visitors here, and uh, some people don't know who I am, and I'm not, I don't have a collar on, so I'll introduce myself. I'm Deacon Jeff Prickett, and I am the pastoral leader here. Uh, this parish does not have a pastor. They got gypped. They got a deacon. And uh, so uh, that's how it works here. But um, if you're visiting, we're thrilled to have you here. Um, I know tonight you will go away feeling differently about your faith. I, am, I will guarantee that. And if you, if you don't feel that way, I'll give you your money back. <laughs> anyway, um, let's begin tonight with prayer. Just we'll ask for the Holy Spirit to be with us and, and uh, have our hearts open to that message this evening. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. Thank you, Lord Jesus, for all the blessings that you give us. Thank you for bringing everyone here safely this evening. We ask that you bless Kramer as he gives us your message this evening, not his, but your message. We ask that you open our hearts to the Holy Spirit and what we will receive this evening and take that with us as we go forward to be your disciples. We ask this all in Jesus' name. Amen. In the name of the Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Amen. Well, for those of you who are members and um, have been here for the last year, you know I have talked about Kramer over and over and over, probably ad nauseum for you. You're like, enough for this kid, all right? Well, he's here. Um, the way we met was actually through his aunt. Um, it's a long story, but she hooked me on to his book and just said, just read it. And uh, we went on vacation to Florida last year, my wife and I, and uh, we flew down, and I read it on the way down, and I read it the next day, and the next day, COVID hit. And uh, we were watching the news, and we were afraid we would get stuck there, that the airports would shut down, so we flew home. And uh, I read the book in three days, though, and I was so impressed with it that we started communicating via email and then text messaging and talking to each other, and we wanted this to happen a lot sooner, but this is as soon as we could work it out. So I am so pleased to have Kramer here tonight, and I think you need to learn a little bit more about him. So I'm going to just read you the bio that I wrote, and hopefully this will help you. Kramer Soderberg, his last name is Soderberg, and if that name is familiar to you at all, his dad, Brad, is the assistant coach at the University of Virginia. The head coach happens to be Tony Bennett, a Preble grad and NBA player. So there is the relationship there. Kramer grew up in St. Charles, Missouri, and had a passion for basketball, just like his dad from an early age on. Not just a good high school basketball player, but a great one. He was a three-time All-State selection in the state of Missouri, and his senior year, he was named the Gatorade High School Player of the Year in the state. Now look at this guy. Are you 6'1"? Oh no, I'm about 5'10". <laughs> Players of the Year in high school are 6'7 or 7 foot. They're not 6 foot. And uh, that really shows you how gifted he is and how talented he is and how hard he worked. His basketball success continued in college as well, first at the University of Miami in Ohio, and then at Lindenwood University where he played for his dad. In Kramer's words, he adamantly pushed aside his Catholic faith for the first 25 years of his life. After focusing more on his faith and doing detailed research, he's now a devout and enthusiastic Catholic and brings the gospel to people of all backgrounds and age groups. His book, which is available in the gathering area after, Fill Your Cup for Christ, A Spiritual Journey Sown and Grown Through Sports, has had tremendous success and is impacting the lives of all who read it, including me. Late last year, his book earned two significant approvals from the Catholic Church. One is called The Nihil Opstat, 
which is certification that his book is not objectionable on doctrinal or moral grounds. So it is sound in terms of its Catholic faith. The second approval is called the imprimatur. It's an official license by the church to print his book as an ecclesiastical book or simply a book of the church. So it is approved in both ways by the Catholic Church. And that's very hard to get, by the way. An assistant coach at the college level for several years, two weeks ago, on April 13th, he was named the head coach at Millican University in Decatur, Illinois. He has a loving Catholic Christian partner and his wife, Andrea. They're way in back. <laughs> Andrea's way in back. Wave your hand. And three wonderful children. Creighton, Finley, and Paisley. <laughs> Loud children, too, so you'll, you'll hear them, I'm sure. Well, they won't talk to me. So uh, anyway, it's my great privilege to introduce to you Kramer Soderberg. Thank you, Deacon. Appreciate it. All right. So I'm going to start the day with a golf club which is strange because I'm a basketball coach, but I like to play golf, even though I'm not very good, probably like most of us in here who play golf. So as a basketball coach, you learn to, to be a storyteller. You learn to do that with your kids. You learn to tell stories. You engage them through stories. Um, I, know, I know some of you guys have read my book, so I didn't want to reiterate a lot of the stuff that I talked about in my book. I wanted to bring something different. Um, so I'm going to tell a little story about golf. If any of you know golf at all, you know um, a man named Gary Player. Gary Player is a famous golfer, legend um, on the PGA Tour from South Africa. As famous as he is in the States, he's even more famous in his own country. Um, he's, he's won many majors. He's still, you know, if you watch the Masters, he still is one of, you know, the opening group. Um, so the story goes that when Gary was still a player, he had an incredible work ethic, you know, work ethic, like a legendary work ethic. And one day he was out on the driving range as normal, you know, working on his game. And at the driving range, they kind of roped off the area that he practiced so that the fans couldn't get too close to him. So Gary's playing, he's swinging, you know, he'd been there for a while just working on his game. And a little kid kind of worked his, up, his way up to the ropes there. And he said, Mr. Player, Mr. Player. And he, Gary just kind of got distracted. For, Mr. Player, what kid? I'm, you know, I'm, I'm golf. I'm working here. No, Mr. Player, can I talk to you for for just one second? Yeah. What What do you need? What do you need? Mr. Player, you are my favorite golfer. I, I've watched every uh, every round you play. I love you. I, I want to be just like you. I want to be a professional golfer. I want to win majors. I want to play at the Masters just like you. I, I want to be a professional golfer. And Gary Player said, kid, I don't think you really do. I, 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 don't, I don't think so. No, Mr. Player, I do. I promise. I, I want to be a pro golfer more than anything in the world. And Gary Player said, okay, kid. Run to the pro shop and grab two buckets of balls, two large buckets, and bring them back here. And large buckets had 250 balls in each of them. So the kid, oh, yes. So the kid runs to the pro shop. He grabs two buckets of balls, and he brings them back, and he drops them in front of Mr. Player. There you go, Mr. Player, two buckets of balls. He said, all right, kid, grab your clubs. Start hitting. And the kid, oh, my goodness. My hero, he's going to let me, he's going to let me hit with him. So he pulls out the golf balls. He sets them down, and he starts swinging. Boy, this kid's fired up. He's knocking the ball. He's hitting them, and he keeps going. And he gets all the way through one bucket, and he said, Mr. Player, one bucket. He said, good job, son. Hit the next one. And he keeps going. He gets through 300, 400, 500 balls. Mr. Player, I did it. 500 balls. He said, good job, son. Now go to the pro shop and get two more. So, all right. So he runs back to the pro shop. He gets two more buckets of balls. There you go, Mr. Player. Keep hitting, son. So by this time, his hands are a little sore. You know, he's starting to get blisters, so he gets his golf gloves out, puts them on. <sighs> All right. So he keeps going, gets through the third bucket of 250. Now, now his blisters are breaking. There's blood sinking through his gloves, but I can't stop. I can't stop. I got to do this. My, my hero wants me to go. I'm going to keep going. So he, puts a, he double gloves it. 
This kid double gloves it just so he can keep going. And he keeps going. He gets through, finally he gets through a thousand golf balls. A thousand golf balls. He's worn out, but he goes up, Mr. Player, I did it. A thousand balls. He said, good job, son. All right, grab your bag. We're going to go out and play 18 holes of golf. Oh, my gosh. Oh, Lord. But you can't say no, right? This is my hero. I got, I got to go with him. All right, so he grabs his bag, goes up to the first tee, and tees off with his hero. And him and Gary Player, they go all through 18 holes of golf. They finish at about 1 o'clock in the afternoon. And they come down 18. Boy, this kid, he's tired. He's carrying his bag, but he's worn out. He finishes the round. Mr. Player, thank you so much. What? I mean, this was amazing. Playing with my hero, a full round of golf. Thank you, thank you. Well, what do you mean, son? We got to go grab some lunch, and then we're going to play another 18. And the kid just is beside himself. <sighs> so he's not going to say no, though, right? It's Gary Player. He has, to, he has to keep going. So they grab a sandwich, and he musters up the energy to play another 18 holes. Oh, my goodness. And by about 6 o'clock, he's coming down 18th fairway, and he's dragging his bag, boy. He's dragging it. But he finishes the 18 holes. He said, Mr. Player, thank you so much. Thank you so much. Two rounds of golf with my hero. What an amazing day. I'll see you later. Hey, son, where are you going? After my second round, I go to the putting and chipping green, and I chip and putt for three hours. And it, the kid just can't believe it. But again, you can't say no. Can't say no to your hero. So he goes, 6 o'clock, and he puts and chips with Gary Player for the next three hours. By that time, the sun is breaking below the, below the skyline, and it's starting to get dark. And Mr. Player came over to the little guy, and he put his arm around him, and he said, Good job, son. Great job. It was a hard day. You hit a 1,000 golf balls on the range. You played two rounds of golf, and you chipped and putt for three hours with me. Great job. And the kid was so proud of himself. He did it. You know, Gary asked him to do it, and he did it. He said, Mr. Player, I can't thank you enough. Thank you so much for letting me do this. It was a dream come true. I'll never forget it. And as the kid was walking away, Gary called out to him. He said, son, I'll see you tomorrow. I do this every day. Come on back. And the kid never showed up. The kid never came back. So I'm going to leave that story there, and we'll get back to it. As Deacon mentioned, about two weeks ago, I was um, offered the head coaching job at Millican University, became, became a head coach for the first time in my career. Great joy, gift from God. Um, but it, it's, it's brought on some, some nervousness for me. Obviously, I'm a young coach. You're taking over a program. Millican's been bad for a long time. Um, so there's a level of nervousness to it. And, you know, I've talked to my dad, talked to a lot of people. And what I want to do today for this talk is take you into my first team meeting. I want you guys to imagine that you're kind of flies on the wall in my first team meeting. And any coach will tell you when you take over a program, what you have to start with first is the culture. You don't start with the offense or the defense first. You don't start with the drills. You start with the culture, the foundation. What is this program going to be about? And then you talk about the goal. After you set the culture, you talk about the goal. And then after you talk about the goal, then you talk about how we're going to achieve that goal. So I want to take you into to my meeting with my players. And I had them all sitting here in front of me. And I had a whiteboard behind me that was covered up. And I said, gentlemen, on this whiteboard is what is going to give us success. On this whiteboard is all that we need to be successful at Millican University. If we achieve these things, we will be successful. If we fail at these things, we will fail. And I removed the sheet, and it said, Humility, passion, unity, servanthood, and thankfulness. It said those five things. It said, Humility, don't... Humility, know who you are. 
passion. Don't be lukewarm. Unity. Don't divide our house. Servanthood. Team ahead of self. And thankfulness in all circumstances. I said, gentlemen, this is Millican basketball. These are our five pillars, our pillars of success. If we as individuals and we as a team embody these pillars to the fullest, we will be successful. If we don't, we will fail. And if you guys follow Tony Bennett or Dick Bennett at all, those five pillars probably sound familiar to you. Dick Bennett installed those five pillars, those exact five pillars, when he went to the University of Wisconsin. And a little fun fact is, before the Cole Center was built in Madison, Dick buried a laminated sheet with those five pillars in the grounds where the Cole Center would be built. And that's what he built his program on. And my dad was his assistant, and he grew up with those pillars. He became a better and better coach learning under Dick, under those pillars. And my dad used those pillars in his program, and I played under them. And Tony used those pillars in his program at Virginia. And when, but the day I gave those pillars to my players, I called up Dick, and I asked him, I said, Dick, would it be okay if I used your five pillars? And of course, he, w- he was gracious as always, and he said yes. And he said, but I want you to know where those pillars come from. They come from the smartest man who's ever walked the earth, Jesus Christ. Dick took the Bible before he went to Wisconsin, and he looked through that Bible, and he found things that he wanted his program to be about. And what he pulled out were those five things, humility, passion, unity, servanthood, thankfulness. And that's what I'm building my program on. And I thought, what a good way for me to kind of organize my speech in that way, because really, we are all spiritual athletes. We are all spiritual athletes, and first, we have to lay our culture. We have to have a base, and those five pillars, those virtues are beautiful. There are so many good pillars, so many good virtues that we can, that we can follow, that we can try to attain as Christians, but those five, I really, really think are special. So I want to talk about those five pillars from a spiritual perspective. First, Humility, know who you are. Humility is not thinking less of yourself, but thinking of yourself less, right? Humility is knowing what you are good at and what you struggle with. Knowing your strengths, knowing your weaknesses, knowing your vices and your temptations. That's humility, knowing who you are as a person. I have a quote here that I love. The most powerful weapon to conquer the devil is humility. For as he does not know at all how to employ it, neither does he know how to defend himself from it. That's St. Vincent de Paul. Humility. Know who you are. The opposite of pride. I have a couple stories that embody humility a little bit. When I played at Lindenwood for my dad, We had a player on the team. I won't say his name. We had a player on the team. He was an incredible athlete, shot blocker, defender, but he wasn't a very good shooter. He wasn't a very good shooter. And one game, the team knew he wasn't a good shooter, and they were backing off. They were literally playing him in the lane. And he caught it at the top of the key. He was wide open, so he took that shot, missed it. Next time down, same thing. They were guarding him in the lane. He caught it wide open, took that shot, missed it. My dad yanked him, brought him on the bench. Son, what are you doing? He said, Coach, I was open. He said, there's a reason you're open. That young man lacked humility, right? He didn't didn't know what his strengths were. His strengths were defense and dunking, not shooting. Another young man that I went to school with, he he struggled with his his weight um, in high school. And one day, I, I... Noticed him walking to school when I, when I came to school. And then after school, he walked home. And that was unusual. I had never seen him do that before. And the next day, I saw him do it again. And again, he just did it. And I, I didn't know why. And I kind of thought, forgot about it. And every day, he kept walking. And then maybe a month later, I saw him. He was doing a little jog this time. 
He wasn't, he wasn't running fast, but he was doing a little jog. He wasn't walking anymore. And then a couple months later, he was, he was running now. He was running. And then a few months later, he was really running. And sure enough, by the end of his high school career, he had lost a bunch of weight. And just what an example of humility, right? He knew that he wanted to lose weight, but he didn't start by trying to run. He started, what can I do? What, what can I do? What are my strengths right now? I'm just going to walk to and, from, to and from home to school. And then he got a little bit better, and he started jogging. Then he got a little bit better, and he started running. Humility. Know who you are, your strengths and your weaknesses. So good. Jose Maria Escriva, he's one of my favorite saints. He has a quote that says, Don't aspire to be like the gilded weather vane on top of a great building. However much it may glitter, however high it may be, it adds nothing to the firmness of the structure. Rather, be like the old stone block, hid it in the foundation, underground where no one can see you. And because of you, the house will not fall. Humility. Humility. Beautiful quote. Number two, passion. Don't be lukewarm. And this is so biblical. Right out of Revelations. So, because you are lukewarm, neither hot nor cold, I will spit you out of my mouth. I see it so often as a coach. Coach, I want to be a college basketball player. I want to I be the best player I can be. Oh, you do? Yeah, yeah, I do. And then they find out what they have to do to be a college basketball player. Ooh, I don't know about that. That's lukewarm. That's lukewarm. Don't be lukewarm. Be passionate. Be passionate. A story that my dad, he, he's going to get mad at me for telling this story. Um, but it's about passion. When I was a junior in college, I just transferred from Miami of Ohio, a Division I school, to go play for my dad at Lindenwood, a Division II school. We had a scrimmage at Missouri S&T. And if you don't know, Missouri S&T, at that time, they weren't very good. They were bad. And we were good. We were very good. And we went to scrimmage these guys. And we kind of walked in thinking, you know, we're better. We know we're going to win. No problem. And at the end of the first half, we were tied with Missouri S&T. And to say my dad was not pleased is an understatement. So instead of taking us down to the locker room like a normal team, he sits all 15 guys across the bench. And mind you, there's, there's fans in the stand. And he picks out one guy, yours truly. And he pulls his chair directly in front of me. Our knees are touching. And he proceeds to ream me out for the next six minutes, the remainder of the half, in front of my mother, in front of the other fans. It was quite embarrassing. But I held my tongue and I held it in. But he said, you think you're a college basketball player? You play Division I. You can come here and do whatever you want. You're soft. You're weak. He just on and on and on. And he taught me a lesson in passion there that I'll never forget. Just because I'm playing at Missouri S&T and not at Kentucky doesn't mean I shouldn't play with passion. And I started the second half, and I put on a one-man full-court press, got four steals and four layups, and we won by 30 in the second half. But he taught me a lesson in passion. Don't be lukewarm. And I know a lot of us here, we know lukewarm Christians. We know lukewarm Catholics. I know most of you guys aren't, but we have someone in our life who is struggling with that, who's lukewarm about their faith. How can we get them to be passionate? How can I get myself to be more on fire? Third, unity. Don't divide our house. I tell my players often, you are a member of the Millican men's basketball program 24 hours a day, seven days a week. You're not, just a, you're not just a member of our team when you're at practice or at a game. You're a member of our team when you're in the class. You're a member of our team on Saturday night at midnight. Gentlemen, I tell, Saturday night at midnight, you're a member of our team. What you do then goes to us. Same thing as Christians. We are not just Catholics on Sunday. We're Catholics on Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, every day. So often we want to divide, divide our faith life. On Sunday, I'm a Catholic. 
every day else. No. No, no, no. You can't divide your house. Unity. Unity. As Christians, as Catholics, we have to be Catholics all the time. I got a quote from Therese of Lisieux, another one of my favorite saints. I have too many favorite saints. You cannot be half a saint. You must be a whole saint or no saint at all. That's exactly right. You can't be half a saint. You can't be a Catholic on Sunday and not on Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday. Unity. Don't divide our house. Servanthood. Team ahead of self. About as biblical as it gets. Christ said, I came not to be served, but to serve. He washed the feet of his disciples for our sake to show us what we are called to do. Putting the interests of others ahead of our own interests. Servanthood. Team ahead of self. Thankfulness. And this, to me, is one of the most important and one of the most challenging. Thankfulness in all circumstances. I say to my players, gentlemen, whether we win games or lose games, we're going to be thankful. Whether you get chewed out by me at practice or praised by me at practice, you're going to be thankful. Whether we're conditioning at 5 a.m. or at 3 p.m., thankful. Whether we are on the highest peak or the lowest valley, we are going to be thankful in all circumstances. And as Christians, that is the key, the key to contentment, the key to peace. Being thankful always. How do you become thankful always? I have found the way to become thankful always is to be aware of Christ always. To be aware of God's presence in your life always. If you can learn to do that, you will become thankful. And if you are thankful, you are joyful. Those three things are connected. Awareness of God, thankfulness, and joy all go together. Something that helped me... When I was probably in 2015, when I kind of started this, this journey, I read a book called Practicing His Presence, a phenomenal book by Frank Laubach and Brother Lawrence. And it basically is kind of the journal entries of these guys who were trying to train themselves to constantly be aware of Christ's presence in their life always, every second of every day. And that book kind of excited me, encouraged me, and motivated me. Maybe I can do that. Maybe I can train myself to do that, to be constantly aware of the Lord all the time. Because for most of us, we're aware of Christ when we're in church. You guys are aware of Christ right now because I'm talking about him. But when you go home and you're doing the dishes or mowing the lawn or you're at work, you forget about him. You forget that he's present in your life, that he's always with you. So I started to try to do this, and I was failing miserably failing miserably. I'd remember him in my morning prayers, and then five hours later, I'd be like, oh man, I forgot. So I started to do three things. Three things that would kind of trigger my awareness of Christ. One thing was nature. Everything that I saw in nature, I tried to allow that to trigger me. God is with me. I saw a sunrise. Jesus, thank you for that gift. A uh, bird chirping. Jesus, thank you for that gift, a, a warm breeze, whatever it may be, I tried to allow that to, to bring back to memory. Yeah, Jesus is with me all the time. God is here. That was number one. Number two, any person I came in contact with, any person, whether it was my wife, my kids, whether it was a stranger or a, a familiar face, I tried to say, in this person is Jesus. In this person is Jesus. So every conversation I had, Every person I met, every person I walked by, even if I didn't say something to him, in that person is Jesus. And how many people do you see a day? A lot. And that brings Christ back to mind. And then the third one is any little difficulty, any struggle, any challenge that I had, I started to call them pinbricks. Any pinprick throughout my day. My boss says something stupid and it annoys me, I would offer it to the Lord, you know. Andrea gets mad at me for not doing the dishes when I was supposed to. She yells at me. Offer it to the Lord. My kids are acting crazy. Offer it to the Lord. All those little struggles and difficulties throughout the day. You offer those little pinpricks up to the Lord. And you again remind yourself of them. Just by doing those three things. I brought Christ back to my mind so often. That there was rarely a time that I didn't remember that he was with me. And if you can learn to do that. I tell you you will float through life like you don't have a care in the world. 
Like you have a giant bubble just protecting you. No matter what comes your way, you will be good because you know you are always aware that Christ is with you. Thankfulness in all circumstances. All right, we've talked about our culture, right? I told you, first as a coach, you start with the culture. If you don't have your culture in place, you're not going to be successful. But after you get your culture, you move on to the goal. What's the goal, gentlemen? What are we pursuing? And as spiritual athletes, there's only one thing we should be pursuing. There's only one thing we should be pursuing, and that's heaven. That's heaven. If heaven isn't your goal, if heaven isn't your ultimate goal, you have the wrong goal. Every person in the entire world, that should be their goal. You can have other goals along the way. There's nothing wrong with having other goals. But if those goals don't lead to your end goal, it's the wrong goal. Our goal is heaven. For victory in this life, we've got to keep focused on the goal. And the goal is heaven. That was Lou Holtz. Pope Francis said, Heaven is the ultimate goal and hope. So heaven's the goal, right? Heaven's what we should be pursuing. I told the people in, in yesterday's group, it doesn't matter if you have a giant mansion down the road with six cars or you're a homeless guy who lives under the bridge by Lambo. It's irrelevant. If you're that guy with the mansion and you don't make it to heaven, failure. If you're that guy who lives under the bridge and you make it to heaven, your life was a success. That's not what the world teaches us, and that's pretty blunt talk, but I've learned to talk blunt as a coach, but that's the truth. That's the end goal. That's all that matters in the end. So if we know that, if we know the goal, we got to say, how do we get there? And how you get there is by becoming a saint. If you're not a saint, you're not in heaven. Only saints are in heaven. Who can ascend to the mountain of the Lord or who may stand in his holy place? He whose hands are sinless, whose hearts are clean, who desires not what is in vain. Psalm 24. To get to heaven, you've got to become a saint. And I know when I first heard this, when I first learned this, I was like, are you kidding me? <laughs> you, I cannot become a saint. You don't know what I have done. There is no way. And I'm sure a lot of us think the same way. You know, Deacon Jeff back there, he can become a saint, right? That, no problem. He can get there. But all of us, no way. No way. That's wrong, though. That's wrong. Pope Francis said, to become a saint is not a privilege for the few, but a vocation for everyone. A vocation for everyone. And then you start to think, well, to become a saint, I have to be perfect. Those whose hands are sinless. I can't be perfect. I'm, I'm human. There, there's no way. Jesus didn't ask me to be perfect, did he? Jesus could There's no way Jesus... Well, Matthew 5, 48. So be perfect, just as your heavenly Father is perfect. Apparently that's the goal. Apparently that's the goal. One of my other favorite quotes. The only real sadness... The only real failure, the only great tragedy in life is not becoming a saint. That's it. That's it. Just like I said, whether you own a mansion or you're a homeless guy, the only tragedy, the only sadness is not making it to heaven. That's it. In my book, um, it's titled, Fill Your Cup for Christ. And for those of you who read the book know the story, but I want to I cover it really quickly. Because this is how you do it. We can't be perfect. Christ asks us to be perfect. He asks us to strive for perfection. But we can't attain it on our own. It's impossible. Only by his grace and by his sacrifice on the cross are we able to do it. But he asks us to strive. And that, that image, the fill your cup, that title came from a story that my dad told me when I was in sixth grade at a basketball camp. He sat all the campers down and he said, I'm going to introduce you guys to three players. Three players. He pulled out a big 64-ounce guzzler cup. <laughs> we were like, what? That's a cup, not a player. He pulled out a big 64-ounce guzzler and a small drinking glass, a medium-sized drinking glass, probably 12 ounces, and about a, you know, a Dixie cup size. 
And he says, this is Big John, this is Jimmy, and this is Little Tony. Big John is 6'7", and he can jump really high and dunk anytime he wants. And that's Little Tony. He's only about 5'9", and he's unathletic, and he can't jump very high. But he said, I don't care how much potential God has given you. I don't care if you're 6'7", and you can dunk whenever you want, or you're 5'9", and you can't jump over that piece of paper. He said, it's irrelevant. All that matters is you get the most out of the potential God has given you. All that matters is you fill your cup to the top. And that's what striving for sainthood is. We've all been given different platforms, different abilities, different strengths. But it's irrelevant. It's irrelevant. All Christ is asking us to do is strive to fill our cups to the top is to strive for perfection, and he will take care of the rest. His grace will handle the rest. So the goal is heaven, and how we get there is becoming a saint. So after I give my players a goal, they're going to say, well, coach, do you got any ideas to help, to help us get there? You know, do you have any drills we can do? Do you have a weight program, an eating plan? Um, yeah, I do. So I'm going to give you guys, the spiritual athletes, I'm going to give you a few things that maybe we can do to, uh, to reach our goal. So the first one, the first one, and this is a, a meaningful one to me, and I think it will be a meaningful one to all of you guys. You have to pick the right coach. you got to pick the right trainer to train you to get there. And this is another aspect of my book that I want to talk briefly about one of my favorite things that I wrote. As Christians, we all have the choice of who we choose to be our trainer. We all have the choice. So I want to put this in perspective by taking us all here, and we're going to imagine that we're all aspiring Olympians. We all want to become a gold medalist. And in four years, we're going to go to the Olympics. And we, before we start training, we have to pick our trainer. Who's going to help us get there? Who's going to help us reach the goal? And I'm going to give you the three options of trainers, and you can decide who you want to choose. Trainer number one says, well, I have a more modern philosophy on training. We're going to train three days a week. It's not going to be very hard. You know, it'll actually be pretty easy and fun. You'll probably enjoy it. Okay, that's trainer number one. Trainer number two says, this training program, it's kind of difficult, but not super hard. We'll probably train four days a week, um, 30 minutes in the morning, an hour in the afternoon. Uh, I'm not going to change, you know, the way you live or anything that you do. Uh, some days will be hard, but most of the days will be pretty easy for you. And then trainer number three comes and he says, this is going to be the hardest thing you've ever done in your life. I am going to train you seven days a week for the next four years. There's going to be days where you hate me. There's going to be days where you want to quit, where you think I'm crazy. I'm going to change the way you eat, change the way you sleep, change all of your bad habits. And if you follow my training plan, I promise you, you will become a gold medalist. I promise you. I've trained thousands of gold medalists in the past. And if you follow my training plan, I will be, you will be a gold medalist. I promise now, which trainer would we choose if we really wanted to be a gold medalist? If we had a little bit of guts and we weren't a sissy, which trainer would we choose? Three, right? Everybody would choose three. No one would choose one or two. Everybody would choose three. And why would we choose three? Because everybody knows, everybody knows when you're trying to attain something that's really difficult, it is going to be hard, right? Everybody knows that. Whether you want to be a great musician or a great doctor or a, a successful businessman or woman, you know it's going to be hard to get there. Same as an athlete. If you want to achieve something great, you know it's going to be difficult. No one would choose trainer number one or two. Everyone would choose trainer number three. And where I'm going with that, for those of you who haven't read the book, trainer number three is the Catholic Church. Trainer number three is the Catholic Church. It's hard to be Catholic. Let's not sugarcoat it. It is hard to be Catholic. It's hard to show up to Mass every Sunday, for sure. It's hard. Confession, hard. 
it's hard to pray the rosary, to go to adoration. Theology of the body, hard, really hard. It's hard to be Catholic. But that makes sense, doesn't it? That makes sense. If we're trying to achieve something great, and heaven is far greater than a gold medal, if we're trying to achieve heaven, of course it's going to be hard. It would only make sense for it to be hard. And that's what I hated about the church when I was younger. That's what I hated about it. I don't want to go to Mass on Sunday, Dad. Stop. I don't want to. Just, I want to stay home in bed. You're telling me i got to go confess my sins to a priest? Why can't I just do it in my room? That's a lot easier. A lot easier. Well, that church down the road, they got, they got a cool, like, smoke machine and, like, crazy lights and an awesome band. They don't even tell me that I have to come to Mass every Sunday. I can just c come whenever I want. That, that's the place I want to go to. Trainer number one and number two, that's for, those, that's for those folks who aren't really in it. When I got older and I started to figure out, okay, Catholic Church is difficult. The Catholic Church is hard. The Catholic Church is taking me out of my comfort zone. I said, wait a minute. Well, that makes sense. Because when I was trying to become a Division I basketball player, that's exactly what I did to myself. I tried to push myself out of my comfort zone. My coaches tried to, tried to train me as hard as they could to attain that goal. So that makes sense. And when I connected those two dots, that's when the church started to, I started to get it. Okay, this makes sense. Of course it would be hard. That makes sense. We got to pick the right trainer. We got to pick the right coach. Don't pick trainer number one or number two. Pick the hard trainer. The one's really going to push you. And then the last thing about trainer number three. The last thing. They got something that no other trainer has. And it's right in there. And I call them spiritual steroids. That's what's in there. That Eucharist in there, that's spiritual steroids. And in this competition, they're legal. And if you don't use them, you're crazy. There's only one church in the entire world who claims that the bread that they give out is truly the body, blood, soul, and divinity of Jesus Christ. Only one church in the entire world. That is the most outlandish claim in the history of the universe. But the Catholic Church claims it. Some other churches say, yeah, he's with the bread, but not, that's, the bread's not really him. Or, yeah, it's a symbol, but that's, it's not him. No, the Catholic Church said, this is him, the body, blood, soul, and divinity of Christ. And you can receive him into your own self every day if you want to. Not just Sunday, every day. He gives his entire self to us so that we can give our entire selves to him. Two flesh, our flesh and his flesh, become one. What a gift. Spiritual steroids. you got to use them. If trainer number three has them, you better pick trainer number three. The Catholic Church claims, the only church that claims that, and we got to figure out whether if it's true or not. If it's true, you got to be Catholic. If it's not true, who cares where you go to church? But when I found that out, when I investigated to see, is this really true? And I found out that it was. I can't not go. I have to go. You can't, you, there's no way. Nothing's holding me back from coming here. Monday, Tuesday, I'm going to go daily mass when I can. I'm going to go to adoration when I can. That's truly him, I'm there. Spiritual steroids. Pick the right trainer. Another thing we got to do. To help us reach our goal. We got to set our priorities. Another snippet from my book. I always tell my, my, my players. Get your priorities straight gentlemen. Get your priorities straight. And if we all were answering honestly. I think. I'm sorry. If we were all answering the way that we were supposed to answer. Our priority list would be set up like this. God. Family, friends, work, and hobbies. That's kind of how it would be set up. Most people would say that way. But I'm going to argue that that's not how it should be set up. 
And Deacon Jeff's probably thinking, who in the world did I hire to come talk to these people? God's not supposed to be your first priority. I don't think God wants to be your first priority. What I think is God wants to be a part of every priority in your life. He doesn't just want to be one on your list. He wants to be involved with one, two, three, four, and five. That's back to the idea of unity. God wants to be first in your life, but also second, third, fourth, fifth, sixth. Every aspect of your life, he wants to be a part of. He wants your priority list to say, God, in my prayer life. God, a part of my family. God, incorporated in my friendships. God, glorified in my work. That's how to properly format your priority list. That's what God wants. Every aspect of your life to revolve around him. We've got to set our priorities straight. Another thing we've got to do. We got drills, right? As a coach, you got drills, you got workouts. And man, trainer number three, I tell you, the Catholic Church, we got some great drills. We got some great drills. The rosary, the adoration, divine mercy chaplet, prayers of the saints. We got it all, man. We got it all. Use those drills, use those prayers, use those things that have been passed down by the saints. Passed down by priests and popes through books. We have so much tradition. Use the drills. Use the equipment. Use the workouts that our church gives us. They're so, so good. And then finally, the last thing we need, the last thing we need to attain our goal is a desire to do so. Is a desire to do so. We have to be properly motivated And the only way you can be properly motivated is by love. Love is the greatest motivator. Nothing else motivates the way love does. If you are not in love with Jesus Christ, you will not attain the goal. If you are not in love with Jesus Christ, as soon as something difficult shows up, something gets in the way, a temptation arises, you will go that way opposed to following Christ. Love is the only thing that will truly motivate you to achieve the goal. And this makes sense. If love is our greatest motivator, it makes sense because Christ said, love is the greatest commandment. If you remember, Mark 12, 30, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, all your mind, and all your strength. All your heart, soul, mind, and strength. And when I first read that, I was, I was kind of taken aback. Like, why would he say, love the Lord with your heart, soul, mind, and strength? Why wouldn't he just say, love the Lord? That would cover it all, right? But I think what he was challenging, with, challenging us with is there's more than one way to love the Lord. Love the Lord with your heart, with your feelings, with your emotions, with your passions. Love the Lord in that way. Love the Lord with your soul, through your, through your spiritual exercises, through your prayers. Love the Lord in a spiritual sense. Love the Lord with your mind. Learn about the Lord. Learn about our faith. Something that I've grown to love so much about the Catholic Church is the intellectual side of our faith. Ours is an intellectual faith as well. We have so much tradition, so much high-level knowledge. Learn about your faith so you can love the Lord, not only with your heart and your soul, but also intellectually with your mind. And then finally, love the Lord with all your strength. With all your strength. And now modern Christianity would tell you, well, you believe in Jesus, you're good to go. Well, yeah, you, you love Jesus and, you know, you care about him. You're good to go. All good. I don't know if that's right. I don't know if that's right. If you remember Peter, Catholic Church's first pope, Peter the Rock, he denied Christ three times. In the midst of Christ's crucifixion, he denied him three times. Hey, you, you know that guy, right? No, I don't know him. I don't know him. One of the worst things 
that someone could do to Christ to deny him. What an incredible sin that the first pope of the Catholic Church committed. And then after the resurrection, Jesus comes back and he confronts Peter. And he says, Peter, do you love me? He says, yes, Lord, I love you. Do you know what he said next? He didn't say, well, thank you, Peter. That's so sweet of you to say that. No, 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 no. He said, feed my sheep. Peter, do you love me? Yes, Lord, I love you. Feed my lambs. Love the Lord with all your strength. Love isn't just fuzzy feelings and kissy face emojis. Love is action. Love is what you do. And the Lord is asking us, love him with all of our strength. With all of our strength through our actions. I know a lot of us here probably struggle um, with a similar thing. Someone in our life who, who's just lukewarm in their faith. And, and you're trying everything in your power to get them, come back to the church, come back to the church. Come to Mass, it's important. And they just, they just keep pushing it aside. I have people like that in my life, and I'm sure everybody in here knows somebody like that, that you're just praying so hard for and struggling with. What I'll say to that, hopefully to give you a level of encouragement, is I remember when I think back on my childhood, I probably can remember a handful of things that my mom and dad said to me. And you guys all know that. You say something to your kid or your grandkid, and it goes in one ear, out the other. They might listen, but they don't hear you, right, most of the time. But what I do remember about my dad, I don't remember a lot that he said, but I remember he went to daily mass almost every day. He went to adoration often, prayed the rosary often. My mom and dad made us say our prayers before every meal, go to mass every Sunday. I didn't remember a lot of what my mom and dad told me, but later on in my life, I remembered what they did. I remembered what they did. And that seed that they planted through their actions, and then, of course, the power of a mother and a father's prayer, sown that seed and grew and it grew and it grew. But plant those seeds of example. That's my encouragement. I know how hard it is when someone's in your life and you just are struggling trying to figure out any way to bring them home and it's just not working. Set the example. Love the Lord with your strength, what you do, and show those in your life that you're doing it. And later on, they're going to think back like I did. Why did Dad go to, to daily Mass every day? Why did he pray the road adoration? Maybe this is more important than I thought. And that's going to start their journey home. I got another quote here from Therese of Lisieux. Jesus looks much more at what we are than what we do. And this is contrary to what I just said, but it's good. And we are, in his eyes, what we sincerely want to be for him. The Lord asks us to love him with our strength and what we do. But we are all flawed, we are all human, and we are going to stumble and fall. And Christ looks more at what we desire to be, what we are striving to be, on whether or not we trip and fall, or whether or not we make mistakes. All he's asking us to do is, again, fill our cup to the top, is to strive. Do we truly desire to be saints? And the only reason we're all not saints right now is because we all really don't, deep down, desire to be so. If you truly desire to be a saint, you will become one. So, just like the little boy in my story desired to be a pro golfer, right? He desired to be a pro golfer. I hope that all of us desire to be saints. And maybe if you don't right now, maybe my talk hopefully kind of puts a fire in you that you want to go home and, and speak with the Lord and ask him, give me, give me the yearning to become a saint. And I hope that that is the case. If, if that ends up happening, I don't want you to be surprised like the little boy in the story at how hard it's going to be. Don't be surprised. 
There's going to be days where you start getting blisters from fighting off temptation, sores in your soul from trying to fight the devil and all his attacks. There's going to be days where you are dragging your bag down 18 and you don't want to do whatever spiritual practice you're called to do. There's going to be days where you're slicing your drive and hooking your irons and you lay down at night and say, there's no way I'm going to become a saint. No way. Don't be surprised by that. Don't be distressed by it. Be motivated by it. That's all okay. But don't be like the little boy and not show up the next day. All you have to do in this life to become a saint is to keep showing up and keep swinging hard. Keep showing up and keep swinging hard and God's grace will handle the rest. So I hope from my talk, setting the foundation of the pillars, setting the goal of heaven, and giving you some ideas of maybe how to get there, and then a reminder of that little story. Don't be like the little boy. Show up the next day. Keep showing up, and you will attain heaven. You will become a saint. So I thank you all for uh, letting me talk to you. I have a little reflection sheet that's out there on the, on the sheet that kind of goes along with my talk that you can take home, share with others, um, you know, do together whatever you'd like. And I think we have a little extra time to, for maybe for me to answer some questions if we want to do that. Um, but if not, thanks again for having me. Any questions? Any questions? Nothing's off limits. Hit it. Sure. Right. Oh, no, no. I, I definitely recruit character first. Recruit character first. Yeah, when I was getting interviewed for the Millican job, they, they said, tell me a little bit about recruiting. And I said, I'm going to recruit a player first based on who they are as a person, you know, before who they are as a basketball player. I want good people. Secondly, I want invested students. I told them, I don't need geniuses on my team. I don't, I don't need 32 ACTs. On, that'd be nice, but I don't need them. But I want kids who care about getting their degree. Thirdly, I want hard workers. I want kids who want to be the best they can be. And then fourthly, I need talented players. So those three criteria come first for me. If they don't fill those three, I don't care how talented you are. So that's kind of how I approach my recruiting process. And then, of course, before I ever offer a kid an opportunity to play on my team, I tell them those five pillars. And I say, if you think you can strive to embody those, I want you on my team. If you don't think you can, if you see, look at humility and <laughs> humility ain't for me, then I don't want you. St. Charles West. St. Charles West. Yeah, the public high school in town. My wife went to Duchenne, the Catholic high school in town. That's right. So we were rivals, uh, but we ended up getting together. So worked out okay. Any other questions? All right. Wow, that's a pretty quiet group. I wouldn't ask questions if I came either. I, uh, I am just so pleased that Kramer was here, and uh, I hope that this inspires you a little bit more in your faith. You know, what he was talking about in terms of looking for spiritual strength and examples, I look at every one of you who are here tonight as my example. You're the ones who inspire my faith. You're the reason that I show up here every morning. And that's why I'm so blessed to be just a small part of this parish. And you are the example for the ones who come very occasionally too. Just not by talking to them. That's okay. You don't have to. But it's by your example. By being here when you leave church, everybody congregates and talks. Everybody is helping everybody around here. That's what they're seeing. And that's what eventually attracts them 
to being a member here or being part of the Catholic Church. So thank you for all that you do. I know that this place is going to grow, not because of me or anything that I do, but because of your example, of your faith for others. So thank you. If you do have any more questions. Oh, okay. My pleasure. Yeah, I, I talk to a lot of people who ha are in the same struggles, are in the same struggles, and I think it's just the power of prayer that's going to end up doing it, but, but those examples plant the seed, and we just have to trust God's grace to bring everyone home eventually, and I believe it will happen. Yeah, I told, I told, right, I told my AD, I said, I had this plan for about a year, so I ain't getting out of it. Um, but yeah, I've been working inside and outside of here. I'm working on hiring an assistant at this, you know, right now. And, um, but I, um, people ask me that, you know, often, you know, are, now that you're a head coach, are you going to, you know, stop, slow down your ministry? And I, I've told my dad, I've told my wife that there's a temptation in college coaching to be quiet about your faith. Um, a lot of coaches are vocal Christians, but there's not a lot of vocal Catholics who are coaches. Um, I think most of the world's okay and, and will will deal with, yeah, he's Christian. But I think Catholicism just has a different level of eh, to it. And people have said, you know, if you're vocal about your Catholic faith, that could affect your recruiting. That could affect you getting jobs. That could let you lose a job. And I've always said, I don't care. I don't care. I want to use my platform as big as it may get that to continue to do what I started doing as an assistant coach when, you know, nobody cared much. Um, I, I, I hope that I'll have more and more opportunities to continue to proclaim the, the truth of Christ and the tr truth of his church um, through my platforms. Um, and that's, that's what I never want to stop. Uh, I know who I am. Some days I struggle with that as well. That's a strong statement. Did, by did the somebody way. else have a question over here? I saw. I thought I saw a hand. No. 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 I, I'm at a very secular school. Um, very secular school. And people ask me often, "Do you, you know, talk to your kids about your faith?" Um, and I, I do often mention my own faith to them, but I never impose it upon them. Again, it's that same idea. I want my example of the way I live to um, intrigue them first. Why is Coach Sodi so joyful when he comes in? Why, why does he treat me the way he does or treat others the way he does? Why, why does he walk around with this aura of, I'm not sure what it is. And I want to build those relationships with the kids that they trust me enough to say, okay, when things do get difficult and they come into my office and close the door, that is my opportunity to present the gospel to them if they don't know it, or if they do know it, to present the truth of the Catholic Church that I've come to find. So I don't try to impose it upon them by any means, but I don't hide it either. I'm not afraid to hide it. And actually, um, I, I have this on my hip all the time. And it was a, a talk by um, Father Calloway, who, who wrote the St. Joseph book, he gave an incredible talk on the rosary, and it inspired me to do this. He said, if you, if you want to slay dragons, he said, if you want to slay dragons, you better have a weapon on you. And he said, back in, back in the times when there was soldiers, they would carry a rosary on their hip, and their sword on their hip, and they would sheathe their sword from, right to, or from left to right. And he said, you better carry your rosary with you if you want to slay the dragon. And I just thought that was so powerful that I started hooking this to my hip and 
I'm going to have it on the sideline with me when I coach. I have it every practice, and it's just a reminder for me. Um, and hopefully, you know, one of those fallen away Catholics, they see me walking by and they spot the little rosary, and maybe that triggers something. But yeah, Father Calloway's talk, if you haven't heard it about Mary and the rosary, it's incredible. Um, but that's what inspired this. Any others? Thanks again for coming. I appreciate it so much. Oh. Boy. Sure. Father Mike, yeah. He's incredible too. I can't shake a stick to him. But yeah, I, I've, I've thought, of, I, I'm always trying to kind of think of different ways to, to do this in a modern world and to especially to reach the younger generations is so important. One of the main reasons I wrote the book is to do so. I tried to write it in a very simple way, you know, a, an easy to read way that was inviting, not too big. The chapters are like two pages long, not only for the young kids because, but I'm a dumb guy so I needed shorter, shorter chapters. Um, that I wanted it to be that way. And I, I started getting on, um, I have an Instagram ministry um, that is, my Instagram account is on my, the reflection sheet there. And that, one of the main thoughts behind that was to try to connect with that younger generation of kid. Um, but that's, that's something I'll have to think about, is those short videos. I'll put that in the, in the ticker. And we'll see if it comes to anything. Thanks for asking. I'll, I'll let you know for sure. Once again, he does have books available um, in the gathering area if, if you're on the way out, and he'll sign them for whoever or whatever you would like uh, in there. So thanks again for coming. God bless you all, and um, have a wonderful evening, and I'm sure I'll see a lot of you on the weekend. Thanks. All right.